be here today. It's really a thrill and delight to be involved with something that's very right John Hansard, since I just work in the building, the chapter of the building, that's just a neighbour to this building itself, actually. So, um, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm a cultural geographer, so I guess I'm a social scientist, so you'll see the kinds of materials that I'm um, using to draw, up some, draw out some conceptual ideas are through kind of interviews, focus groups, um, ethnography, and I have used video as well, but I'm not actually referring to any of that um, in this talk today. But um, a lot of my work has been in the area of food and agriculture, and I've kind of developed this concept of thinking about how do things become food. So when I'm thinking about crafting life, for me this is um, very much an area of crafting life so that it could become edible. Okay. And you might <laughs> learn a bit about food that you eat through this talk today. So, um, so when we think about what these things are, they are kind of plants and animals, and they may become edible, or they may become inedible. You might like to start to think about what you find you do and don't eat. So how do things become food? Here I'm suggesting being attentive to, to the specific encounters between the eater and the edible or inedible. So it's a specific encounter between the person eating and what could become edible or not. And I guess this is a shift when you may go to your fridge and see, oh, it's full of food, but actually you know that some of it doesn't ever get eaten. And I would sort of suggest we should think that that never does become food, that actually becomes waste. So it's an attempt to the specific practices that we use to actually produce something that we will willingly put into our mouth. But then it's not just what we're doing in our own homes that are crafting um, what becomes edible, there's a wider network. So how do our human practices of working with stuff, with things, with this vital, vibrant matter, shape, craft things to make food? So as I said, this, it, I kind of come from that kind of new materialist um, body of work, which, I mean, there's a book um, on the table about um, new materialism that's kind of coming out of philosophy, political theory, and social scientists, social science as well, to kind of engage with um, materialities in a different way. And for me, there are lots of new potential about how we can understand the politics and ethics of the, what I think about as the material connectivities between bodies producing food. So between animals and vegetables on one hand, and the bodies eating food. So whether it's human or animal, or I, mean, I think we could even think about a larger set of things that are actually our consumers in various ways. I guess for me, I've been particularly interested in the human and the animal. So I want to begin by um, talking about um, a performance piece that I saw back in 2001 by William Speakman. It's entitled, With Beauty is Perfection. So during a visit to the Arnolfini Art Gallery in Bristol back in 2001, I experienced a sushi kitchen art installation by William Speakman. The program for the show stated it explored works in which the original meaning or form of an object is lost through a process of transformation. And this is an excerpt from my fieldwork diary. Live fish swimming in a tank. The fish are brought out, killed, prepared, and eaten one by one. This is a spectacle of a process by which things, animal plants, become food. The fish's throat is cut, and the fish wriggles for a minute or so. On seeing this, a young girl cries out, it's still alive. The chef insists, it's dead now. The fish blood soaks the cloths and spills over the preparation board as the animal is skinned, filtered, and prepared before being passed on to the chef, who transforms it into an ornate piece of designer food, sushi. Then the sushi is offered up for consumption to those people incorporated into this installation through observing this spectacle. Some people happily eat the sushi, others do not. So this performance called on the viewer to imagine the unthinkable. And it seems to explore what I, which, what I want to expand upon today about how, these, how do things become food? How do things become edible? 
The sushi never became food and never became edible for those people who refused to eat it. The thing, is it fish, sushi, flesh, is neither social nor natural, but rather a vital agentive matter crafting and being crafted. Over the time space of the performance event, it becomes affected and thus transformed by what is done to it, by humans and non-humans through processes it becomes caught up in. The performance offers a multi-sensory encounter with this process in action. How what happens, how the tastes, texture and smell of fresh fish, the sharpness of the knives, the practice skill of the chef, the damp cloths used to wipe up the blood, the visual appeal of the decorative food designs and the wooden chopsticks all play their part in enacting the process whereby the fish becomes edible sushi, or perhaps inedible sushi. And for me, this performance expressed conceptually the importance for social scientists like myself of working with an ontological position that studies practical activity and the movement, agency, and materiality as co-constituting one another we have to understand matter and practice as co-constituting each other, particularly in our studies of food and agriculture. But in this artwork, a space is opened for close examination of how a thing, an animal or plant, passes through a set of human practices and material processes that do, that craft, the translating, the transforming from food production to food consumption, from thing to food. In this way, that dichotomous tradition of production studies on one hand and consumption studies is broken. For me, both Melanie, Co Melanie, Melanie Jackson's work and the Vital Cohen's work in their artworks are exploring this process of transformation that fascinated William Speakman and that also fascinates me. Their work explores the geographies and histories of meanings, aesthetics, crafts, and tinkerings with materialities that technologists, and scientists, and I would like to add here all of us who cook, who prepare, who eat food, become equally caught up in, in the practices and processes of crafting life. The rest of my talk is going to focus on illustrations of crafting life through further examples of things becoming food, focusing specifically to ask, how does an attention to the processual quality of matters or mattering, to use Karen Barrett's phrase, that generates connectivities between matters both through time and across space, unfold new political and ethical concerns about how we are crafting edible materialities from the living. So continuing um, the carrot theme uh, in Melanie's work, um, I've actually written a little bit about carrots as well. Um, and here, um, I was I carried out focus groups and got people to talk and discuss about which of these carrots they found edible. So you've got your valued carrot, um, you've got your bunched organic carrots, and then your standard big fat supermarket carrots. Um, and this just gives you a flavour of what some people what um, people said in focus groups. But the frozen carrots that you buy in Iceland in plastic carrots. They're going to be peeled and cut in circles. And I can't stand carrots in circles. Searching for them, but they have that sort of canned face to them. So I actually cut mine in irregular shapes and things like that. And that's, you know, with frozen food, you're not going to get that. So here we start to get an idea that there's an aesthetic of the kind of materiality of carrots. That it's quite a sort of a superficial sense about its form and what it should be like if you're going to engage with it, if it becomes edible for you. But in the second example, I think we start to see how some of the qualities of material, of material processes actually also get caught up in working out whether something is edible. Now these here, referring to the baby bunch of carrots, whether they are organic or non-organic, the vitamin has not developed to these carrots. So we start to see how kind of narratives about some sense of the kind of the general, how, how things are generated, how things grow, and how they are sustained actually starts to also um, become part of what I would like to call a material connective aesthetic that shouldn't be 
um, forgotten when we start to engage with how, with a kind of processual approach to how we work with matter. So we have both superficial and integral and processual qualities of material that are shaping the aesthetics of availability. That suggests that the body of matter, its generation, perhaps, could be a political protagonist in um, public debates on the acceptability of foods developed through the use of biotechnology. And I guess specifically at the time when I was doing this, there was a lot of discussion about genetically modified food and how that featured in discussion about edibility. Or contemporary discussion about petri dish meat. We might think about how a sense of the processual development there features in narratives about edibility. But also, there are wider forms of food processing that people do know about, or maybe they don't know about. And maybe if we knew a bit more about it, we might take a second look about whether or not we would actually find something edible or not. And these are perhaps more complex than just the amount of sunshine or the kind of growth rate. So moving on, I now want to kind of turn to the meat industry. Because this is an example from the meat industry which kind of figures some of the developments in meat science um, that have happened alongside the public engagement with farm animal welfare. This has led to the recognition of animals as sentient beings across Europe since 1997. The rise in public concern about the suffering of farm animals has led to recognition that animals are sentient, that to use John Webster's phrase, they have feelings that matter to them and it's interesting how we are living in a time where we have development in animal science and meat science that is kind of recognising this change in popular feeling and understanding. So I kind of want to suggest that we can think about a wider context in society where it becomes possible to know things. But importantly, it's again about what we're coming to know about the processes and learn about the processes of matter. So um, here... I'm interested in thinking about how these six pieces of meat are being interpreted, both in terms of their aesthetic and the function of the meat cuts, in terms of actually what you can do with them. The top left-hand corner, we have what the industry calls pale, soft and exudative meat. Okay. This is pork flesh, um, and if the meat comes out this colour, which actually means that it sits in, in water in effect, it means that the animal the pig was stressed in the eight hours leading up to slaughter. Here we have pale, dark and dry, this bottom right hand corner. This means that the animal had prolonged stress through its life. The four in the middle are acceptable. Okay? The material processes that we're seeing here is we're seeing meat that actually is speaking of the living experiences of the animal that are still resonating, that are still a footprint in the quality of the meat post-slaughter. So we're here talking about how matter processes are resonating in a, more than the life of the flesh whilst living. And this comes about through the stress levels affecting how, with the depletion of oxygen from the body, how the, the flesh changes because of the, glyc the glycogen, which is the stress that's built up and how that actually affects the material quality. But I, again, this is just an example of getting you to engage with the matter processes and how that becomes instrumental in terms of the kind of the aesthetics of how things become edible or inedible and commercially affecting what is possible. It's not possible to do much processed meat in the top left-hand corner because it's just too wet. There's too much watery just about and would look very poor on the supermarket shelf. The meat would in effect be sitting in pools of water. So, um, I now want to um, move on to think more about um, parts of the meat industry, to spend a little bit more time talking about my final example, which develops the idea of a food animal as visceral objects within the practices of the livestock production and meat processing industry. These people who are basically crafting food from animal bodies. As I've already mentioned, that um, in Diana Cool and Samantha Frost's book on new materialism, they talk about the visceral as 
a political protagonist. But I want to think about the visceral body as a political protagonist. Um, but the problem that I face when I start to think about this in terms of the meat carcass is we are talking about one body, but we don't really eat the whole body, we just eat parts of the body. So I started to think about the body as being made up of different parts. So about how what we might think about as these visceral objects, and I'm going to say a little bit more about what I mean by visceral objects. So how do these visceral objects, these parts of the carcass, which are in effect foodstuffs in the making, they're examples of kind of things becoming food. So when I talk about um, the visceral object, there's that term visceral where we kind of think a visceral reaction to something that we you know, don't feel like eating it. It's kind of more like an emotional response. But I actually want to go back to the term visceral as being talking about the internal anatomic organs, or in some cultures it's just referred to offal. But to broaden that definition, to think about a term which actually just talks about any part within the body, but any part, any visceral body, fleshy part, which actually could actually still be and have traces of emotions within it, so it doesn't leave behind that emotional connection, but actually it's just part of a body. So we have these visceral objects. Everybody, everybody is made of visceral objects. So the visceral objects could be skin, bones, muscles, organs, eyes, anything of the body. And I'm to think about how we can think about conceiving bodies as visceral objects opens up new ways of interpreting and analysing what's happening in the meat industry. So the question is, what do we know about the visceral object as a physical protagonist? I think is like a, a new approach to how you might tackle uh, some of these questions in the food industry. Interestingly, I don't know if any of you uh, had any contact with the meat industry, but um, the industry itself recognises that there's a, there, it is always a problem about how to deal with the carcass. They have something called carcass balance or carcass utilisation. This is um, how they talk in terms, of, in terms of cattle. Carcass balance or the proportion of overall beef carcass weight that is present in various primal cuts in both the hindquarter and forequarter segments has a considerable effect on the commercial value of each carcass. Because ultimately, if you produce an animal, you've got to find a home for all the parts of the body. If you don't find a home for it, you probably have to pay to dispose of it. So there's always this question of can you balance the carcass? And I'm going to show you some examples of how we start to see this kind of general question about crafting life, crafting bodies that we actually want to eat, in turn gets into kind of crafting meat-based products to make the medical. So to begin here, I'm talking, this is a quote from a farmer. So you start to see how this starts to play out on the farm. So this is um, a farmer talking about the blonde, which is a particular French breed of cattle. The blonde does the lengthening of the carcass, and they're also very consistent in the way they look. The lengthening means you basically get an extra rib off their back, you know, the longer the back. You can't get enough fat out of them. They are supermarket breeds, not for the special meat counter, because that's about presentation. It's about marbling, the right fat. So they go to McGawley's, which is a slaughterhouse, or into Nobles, Wilds, or Smith's. Now, I don't think they're going to Smith's because they're not poorly bred. They're not manufactured beef. Most of the dairy beef goes into Smith's. So we start seeing how the kind of commercial world, how you work with different animal bodies. And this is basically one herd but that are being kind of crossbred, and different cattle will go to different parts of the market. So we start to see connections between a whole herd of animals in terms of where their body parts end up in the meat supply chain, or who ends up eating them, in what context, on the street, or in, in your home, or maybe if you go to a restaurant. Yeah? There's kind of different places where different parts of the carcass end up. The second quote, so you get 5% more monetary value for an animal producing a carcass with a very high conformation. They are long, they have lovely rounds, high bottoms, and they have a lot of meat to the bone, so they're usually graded U+. So this is like a, here she's talking about her most highly prized carcass and what she hopes to receive um, financially for producing such an animal. 
And really, these farmers are tinkering, they are crafting with the animals they have to work out which to breed with each other in the hope of producing a specimen where they'll be able to get particular um, high returns from it when it gets to the abattoir, which in turn is also a concern about when you send your animal to the abattoir, because you want to make sure it's in the perfect state to get that maximum return for it. But now, turning to chicken. The chicken, which when I set this for my students, most people, most of my students seem to eat chicken every day. You might want to think about your own chicken consumption habits. Is this, carcass balance is a major problem with chicken, this uh, multinational chicken manufacturing process, it says. Because different parts of the world eat different parts of the chicken. If you, if you go to sort of Mexico and sort of South American parts, then they like the dark meat. You go to places like America, Britain, Italy, they like the white meat. So for the chicken manufacturer's description, we get a sense of the global distribution of the chicken carcass as it is broken down into body parts and valued differently across different food cultures. Indeed, the globalisation of food product distribution offers the potential to shift parts of the carcass unpopular in one country to a home in another, where different culinary cultural practices exist. We have a particular example of you know, the walkie-talkies, which are the feet and the beaks, which get sent to South Africa or to China, where there's a big market for those parts. And this is even, um, you know, your southwest local chicken. There's still some parts of it that won't be staying local, that will be stayed off, spinning off to other parts of the world. So now we have this problem with the brown meat and the white meat. So when you're selling brown or white meat into that market, you need to find a home for the other part. And probably our biggest difference in cost of production between ourselves and Thailand is the fact that they can actually sell everything in that chicken. So we've got into a situation in the UK where there's such a predominant interest in the white breast meat that the birds are being produced with very large breasts. It's a different bird from what's being produced in Thailand because they actually are more interested in other parts of the carcass and then you know, consequently you can develop a different kind of bird. So we kind of see how the lives of the animals are changing because of the particular cultural interest but also how that in turn is shaping where different parts of the carcass are ending up and what kinds of food products are being made as we go on to look at. So what we have to do is we have to try to persuade the customer in all sorts of different ways and formats to buy into the dark meat. And that's, you know, one of the biggest marketing challenges within chicken. So different ways and formats may include the convenience and value for money product ranges like breaded chicken products chicken nuggets or chicken based ready meals using chicken derived meat and all these dishes can be made using brown chicken meat but in this, initially there's a seasonality to the commercial challenges surrounding brown meat because during the barbecue season if there is one depending on what kind of summer we have there's less of a problem with dark meat whereas there is a problem for the rest of the year some kind of 40 weeks so there's a big market for exporting these small bits and pieces of dark meat, like the legs and feet. But this can improve the cost of production dramatically, and if you fail to do this, it actually increases costs because of the cost attached to the proper waste disposal. It's commercially more sensible to convert potential waste to be sold for food manufacturing or some other manufactured good than to dispose of it. Um, Another processor spoke of the fifth quarter being rendered from chicken carcasses in Russia. And there's actually um, a lot of, uh, in geopolitical negotiations, global superpowers do talk chicken because of the importance of this industry. Because the industry relies on the global movement of chicken parts to be able to sustain the chicken industry in America because there isn't a home for all those parts. So we have this kind of, um, you know, these incredible, massive global commercial solutions to the problems of the fact that we become fixated with only parts of the animal carcass, particularly in the Western world, the breast meat. And I feel that this is a great example of the visceral object as kind of political protagonist in high-level negotiations, but also in how we might think more um, broadly about some of the problems that we have related to kind of food and agriculture. 
For both the animals growing for meat and the shoppers buying and consuming meat, the commercial practices that are in operation to the balance of the car carcass are conducive towards not only manufacturing chicken bodies, but also human bodies with the capacities that fulfill the demands of carcass balancing. So we kind of wanted to cultivate human bodies that are interested in eating these products that are being used from the least desired parts of the carcass. So in the case of the chicken, by breeding birds with bodily capacities that fit different cultural tastes in different parts of the world, large breast in Europe, where white breast meat is favoured, large thigh birds in Southeast Asia, where the brown meat is favoured, so in the case of consumers encouraging or perhaps manufacturing consumers through the use of price, marketing and campaigns, etc., a lot of work goes on to try and encourage people to, to buy and eat products that contain processed chicken products, like ready meals or breaded chicken products, where less favoured body parts of the chicken can be sold. But obviously to make them edible, these get peppered with artificial colourings and flavourings to make the unattractive meat as attractive to eat. So again, we come back to that issue of the kind of the aesthetic forms to actually make something become food, to make something become edible. And kind of working now towards the conclusion, there's been a lot of debate in kind of um, food studies about how we can understand the spatial paradoxes of the global food system, where we have kind of scarcity on one hand and abundance on the other privilege on one side, suffering on the other, and to sort of try to understand how life and death and all these other paradoxes are kind of perhaps mutually constituted. And I feel that this idea of um, food animals, visceral objects, we start to get into some of those matter connections, which actually start to explain some of these kind of paradoxes that we see happening around the world. This comes back to how we might think about the implications of the work we do in terms of how um, we are crafting life. Because perhaps when we start working with materialities, as Bakker and Bridge comment, we have to confront the problematic of how heterogeneous objects join or are joined together such that particular outcomes result. We are not quite yet in a situation of being able to just grow chicken breasts in a petri dish. We're still faced with the problematic of the body, which perhaps might be a step that we might move towards in the future, but obviously there are big cultural issues around that. So we have to work with those matter processes and what is also being produced when we produce that singular commodity, and to be aware of how that frames and changes the environment that we're in, the fact that there are these other things that are brought into existence. Bakker and Bridge continue by saying, do things interiorise the processes that produce them such that it makes sense to speak of them as both conjoined and complicit in their conjoining? The way in which phenomena appears to us is often kind of separate. Matter processes are too often kind of concealed in, our, in any kind of snapshot view of the world. So it's worth to kind of try, we have to use concepts to try and delve into some of those processes by which things become across space and time, and to think about how things are distributed across space and time, but may have been formed and crafted together in the initial place on a farm. We have one animal that gets spun across lots of different eating places. So just some brief conclusions. So, as I said, the visceral object I think, it facilitates connection between different body parts of different matter kinds. These turn into different matter kinds. Yes, the breast is different enough from the thigh aesthetically for people to choose one over the other, and yet we might think about the connection between them. What I like to think about is kind of commercial practices, because this is how the commercial world is actually working with matter, with materiality, with the cosmos, in, ha in what they're producing. It's quickly for them about crafting edibles to dispose waste body parts to which whatever mouths will eat them. So thirdly, when we think about who gets what to eat and where and what price, this is related to the exacting terms of the visceral object on meat practices. The fact you cannot just produce a part, it has to come within a whole body. And I guess it's quite simple in some way to think about the carcass. 
But remember, there was the herd, there's the whole family that spins out. So it's actually a larger body than even what we might initially think. And I think that this is perhaps the beginning of a way of <coughs> developing an integrated approach to the material effects and affects of food animal intensification and the expansion on human health, animal health, human nutrition, animal nutrition, and the broader environment that we're living in by thinking through this. So I hope this has been a way of thinking of me showing how a social scientist, our engagement with how we're crafting life, is helping us to map out new kinds of relationships between the things that we're finding in the world, that things become food that we're popping into our mouths. Thank you.